Hi, welcome to the noise path. Let's do one more of these mailbag items before getting back to the regular videos. And this particular item is an Azure U2001. This is a USB average power sensor, and it works up to six gigahertz. And it goes down to minus 60 dBm, which is only one nanowatt. It's really quite a small amount. You can even get them to go lower than that, up to 20 dBm. So I've been told that this one has a broken sensor. Basically, the main detector is damaged probably by putting too much power into it more than 20 dBm. I think the damage level of these things is like 25 dBm. So we're going to take it apart and see how it works, especially because this is a fully enclosed unit. Unlike other power sensors that require a power meter, this is all encompassing. So everything is there. It's got a type N connector in the front, as you can see, and it has this kind of a USB, a mini USB port with this screw terminal, which you can screw in directly. It has a special cable that comes with it, but it will work with any USB cable. So before we take this apart, I think it's worthwhile to review how exactly does this thing work and what's so special about these power sensors and what kind of them are available. And then we can do a dig in and a teardown. So let's think about the behavior and the mode of operation of these power sensors in general. So the easiest way to make a power sensor would be to dissipate the incoming RF energy into, let's say, a resistor, something that would convert that RF energy into heat. And then you can measure the change in temperature with, for example, reference to some other component that is not receiving the RF power, and from that, and knowing the environment and the temperature coefficients and the thermal resistance and all that, find out exactly what the RF power is. So you can imagine this is the easiest way to do it, because resistors are in general quite broadband, and therefore it allows you to do a nice, fully integrated power that you integrate over all frequencies at the same time, for example. But at the same time, it's not difficult to understand that if the power is very, very, very small, the change in the temperature would therefore be very small also. So measuring very low power signals, you know, in the minus 70 or 80 dBm, is going to be very difficult using a thermal method. So this thermocoupler method is good for very high power, but not very good for very low power. Now, on the other hand, you could use a diode. It's a simple diode capacitor detector. In that situation, you're integrating the power over, over a capacitor, so kind of like almost like a peak detector. But there's a, there are various types of power detectors, but let's imagine that this diode integrates the power into a capacitor, and then you measure the voltage in that situation. So right off the bat, because you have a diode, you can do this at very, very low input powers, and that's quite a bit better. But then at the same time, at very high input powers, a diode would no longer work because you move out of its square law detection region, and therefore it wouldn't work. But regardless, we're going to take a look at that a little bit later. But let's assume that you have some method of doing that. In this case, the capacitors would be for filtering over the diode detection. Then you can have a chopper. This chopper allows you to eliminate some of the environmental effects and some offsets that can happen. This is a normal chopper behavior. That's, what, that's why these amplifiers are used. And what this does is that it removes the signal from being at DC into some AC signal. And that you can put then through some kind of an amplifier. And that AC signal would be, let's say, in a couple of hundred hertz in that situation. And then you pass that into some external digitizer that allows you to measure the power coming in. You can also have thermistors and so on built into it so that you can account for variation in temperature and so on, a whole bunch of different types of calibration and auto zeroing before the AC amplifier. So this technique of detecting the power, chopping it, bringing it to its AC, amplifying it, calibrating it is basically the flow of almost every power sensor that's on the market. So these power sensors can also be expanded into the you know, complete block diagram or schematic if you want to see. So this is a thermocouple version of it. You can see the thermocouple here, and that is measured using a classic thermocouple behavior that you know is quite common, and then it goes into this chopper amplifier, and then into this AC amplifier, and finally going out. So this is what you would find in a thermal base, a thermistor based or a thermocouple based type of power sensor. But the U2001A, the one that we're taking a look at, this USB based power sensor uses a detector, a diode one, and the block diagram of that is quite different. So what they do for this, which is quite clever, is instead of using just a single pair of diodes, they use two sets of diodes. And these two sets of diodes have an attenuator in between them. So that means that you have two different levels of power arriving at a different set of diodes. That means that you can now run them much more efficiently and much more predictably inside of their square raw region. So if you have a modulated signal, a broadband modulated signal that has a high peak to average ratio, you can switch back and forth between these and find out the exact power by making sure that all the detectors are always inside this square law region. There are papers and patents and so on written on these. 
topics, but you can even see here that the lower range and the upper range are quite different. But the total range of this power sensor is from the lowest of the lower range to the highest of the upper range. And this structure we should be able to find when we do the teardown of this unit. So this is the block diagram now of what's inside this USB-based power sensor. So here's our diode detector structure. You can see that we have the high side and the low side. They use different number of diodes. We have probably more than this inside of this particular module. And then we have these isolation switches in the front. Now this is very useful for this particular power sensor because it allows you to zero the power sensor and also calibrate it while RF power is being applied because this isolates completely everything from the right side to the left side. This is most likely going to be somewhere on the PCB. And of course the rest of this is exactly the same as before. You have your chopper amplifier. Now you have two amplifier ACs. These are high gain and low gain because you have two separate paths coming in and you're going to need a dual channel ADC. And then of course some DSP embedded processor is going to be there. These guys use a tremendous amount of computation because you have to calibrate and find out all the scroll raw region behavior. You have two sets of detectors. You want to co-process all of this. There's a lot, a lot of stuff going on. There's also ADCs built in this with thermistor, which measure the temperature and take that into account for calibrating all that stuff out. So when we do a teardown of this module, we should be able to find almost all of these components. From the front detector, this is going to be the very interesting, some custom-made part uh, that uh, Keysight or Angelon makes. And then the rest of it will be some stuff on the PCB. So all of that should be detectable and going to be quite interesting. So let's take a look. And there is Pooch always planning his next attack from somewhere behind the instruments. All right, let's take a look and see what we've got inside of this power sensor. The construction is really quite great. Even though this is not meant to be opened very often, we even have metal inserts inside the chassis. We have a small light pipe here which comes in contact with an LED on the other side of this and very nice shielding that essentially hugs this entire structure. We'll take a look at this very closely. You can see a clear two board construction where we have all of our digital stuff on one side and all of our analog stuff on the other side and the USB interface right over here. So we'll take a look at this and take it apart one step at a time and eventually maybe we can even see where the damage is inside the detector which is in the front over here. So let's take it a step further. So let's take a look at the digital side of this board where all the computation happens. In the heart of it, we have an analog device's Blackfin embedded processor. This thing is a fairly powerful DSP core, that's the Blackfin core, along with a lot of high-speed peripherals, allowing you to dump data in and out of memory, whether it's flash or SDRAM, as well as grabbing data from some serial ADC, which we will see. On the left side over here, we have a flash memory. So this is where all the calibration coefficients would be stored. And when you connect it to the computer, it will grab all that data and pass it to the machine. On the right side, we have some SDRAM. It's interesting to see how much memory there is on this because I would imagine this is just to buffer all the data coming from the ADC. I'm surprised they need so much because there's also some SDRAM inside of this. It could also be that this is a kind of a modular design they have for many applications, not necessarily designed for this specific power sensor. And then here we have a USB 2.0 controller. That's no surprise since the USB port is right over here. So all of this is essentially doing the functions of the calibration, internal processing, passing the data back and forth. Pretty straightforward. The LEDs are right over here. This is where it's connected to the light pipe. Now if you flip it to the other side, we will see all the analog interface. This is a trigger port up here. We have some analog switches. This could be switching back and forth depending on how the detector is working and maybe switching back and forth with some references and some further analog processing and so on. And here in the corner, this tiny component is our ADC. This is a dual channel, 1.5 mega sample per second, simultaneous sampling per channel. And this is 12 or 14 bit resolution from linear technologies. And it has a serial interface, as you can see, with a very few, few number of IO pins it has. And the flow of the data becomes really obvious when you look at it. So the sensor is right there. And it's a ribbon cable coming right out of here. And we're going to take that apart and take a look at it. Once it's processed through this, goes into here, it's sampled. And then this is right on this connector. So the data just flows right through this connector and back into here. So very nice design, very logical the way this is put together. And look at this, all of this chassis metal custom made. Yeah, as always, Keysight really doesn't pull back any punches. They really make everything as expensive as they can. So let's go ahead and now take this one step further. We can see the other side of the boards and of course the nice detector in the front. And here's the other side of the two boards. There's actually not much going on, just some inductor, potentially some DC-DC conversion, but there is a ribbon cable attachment point here. And this sits exactly on the other side of the flash memory. So this is probably how the, the information is downloaded into the memory and potentially how it's calibrated when it's opened up. 
these pads over here, this exposed pads, is where the sensor directly plugs into it. So this assembly is done essentially completely separately from each other. And that allows you to replace these boards or the sensor if something goes wrong. Now for the sensor itself, here we are. You can see the ribbon cable directly come out of it. And these pads make contact directly with these points over here. And this thing gets assembled like this, quite nice. And look at how th they put this together. Because this doesn't go through the whole of this nut over here, there is a slit where you can slide in the ribbon cable through it and then close it up. So it's going to be quite interesting to open this and see the structure in here and then look at under the microscope the entire front end. All right, I loosened these interfaces. So should, we should be able to separate this. Normally, you never take this part apart, of course, because you, you don't want to damage the connector and its alignments. But we can see how it's made. There we go. So here's the center pin. And the center pin does have this part that makes contact. This should be somewhat uh, springy. Yeah, you can see that's how the contact is made. So this part, there's nothing unusual. I think this should come out. There we go. Yeah, so there's our center pin. This is a type N connector, of course, so this maintains our nice 50 ohm interface. These are all machined high precision components. There we go. And at the end of that, we have the contact. So this is how they manage to get some degree of freedom. The degree of freedom is the compression of this pin against that gold plate that you see at the bottom. And that is yet another part. I think I should be able to even separate this. Yeah, let me take a moment and I think these two pieces come apart. All right, let's see. One more piece here. Again, we don't intend to put this back together. So there we go. That's just uh, another interface point. There you go, this will come out. Our spacer, our washer, and this piece, here we go. One more, and in there, now loose, and there is the connection to the main detector. Here's another interface. Ah, look at that. Ah, that's a capacitor, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this is probably what's giving us our DC block. There we go. You've seen something like this before. That, that very, very thin plate that you see, that's the capacitor. You should be able to measure that separately if you want to. So now we say take this apart. There you go, something else fell out of it. Tiny little piece. <laughs> Some space or somewhere. So we should be able to open this as well. We keep going until it's loose. There we go, look at that. There's our detector, individually serial numbered. There's nothing in here, it's just mostly spacers and so on. There we go, something else fell out of it. And I should be able to remove this by finding the correct alignment. Difficult to do on camera. But look at that. There it is. That's the magic. We're going to have to definitely look at that under the microscope. But we should be able to slide this out of here, like so. So this is nothing again. This is everything in here. Yeah, this is going to require some further investigation. You can see individually labeled, of course, the serial number, because these are made one at a time. All right, we got to look at this more carefully. All right, so let's take a look at this under the microscope. So here's the module and the ribbon cable, of course, coming from here. And then once it reaches this tiny little board, you can see the different wire bonds. Now, the way this is assembled, it means that these last wire bonds at the edges, which are, I believe are capacitors, this capacitor here and this one here for decoupling, these are done at the end because this little board slides into this metal container and those must be added afterwards. This is a lot of manual work and a lot of scratches you, key, you see on the surface clearly done one at a time. So if I tilt it a little bit, we can see better inside. There you go, that's our detector module over there. And the contact to the detector is done obviously from the front. So if you look at this a bit more carefully, and get a nice view. There it is. That's where the connection happens from the outside of the coax. That's the transition. And that transition, you can see, thins out. And it ends up in a ground signal, ground coplanar waveguide interface directly to our detector chip all the way on the inside. So we should be able to maybe pull this out of this chassis. But this is going to be a destructive process because these wire bonds are going to get torn apart, basically, once you pull this out. You can see that there's either silver epoxy uh, on the edges when they slide this in. So we might be able to heat it up and then pull it out of this container. Even if it destroys it, again, it doesn't matter. We just want to see what it looks like. All right, so I managed to get this out and it's a little bit more interesting than I originally thought. The substrate is not ceramic. It looks like it might be some kind of quartz. It's actually quite transparent. You can see if I slide this underneath it, you can kind of see right through it. It's some kind of quartz or quartz-like material. And then you can all still see, of course, the wire bonds are there, but the ones that got cut off when I pulled it out of the modules are there. So there are several analog interfaces to the ribbon, as expected when we saw from the block diagram. Some power supply, some decoupling at the top and the bottom. 
But interestingly enough, if I flip this over and we take a look on the other side, you can see that there is a window, <laughs> a cutout window there. It's a little saturated right now, but I'll put it on a different microscope so we can get a better look at it. And this is the direct look at the IC on the other side. So we should be able to take a look at the diodes a little bit more carefully. If I tilt it in a more an extreme angle, you can see indeed that there is a cutout there. Quite interesting. And you can see it also the substrate as well. Yeah, very neat. So we should be able to examine this more carefully, but everything we said about how this is put together still holds. We can see our ground signal, ground transition into coplanar from this coaxial input. There's some tiny thin film resistors there, there probably some matching or some interface to this chip uh, to make sure that it is properly terminated and the capacitors on the surface. Yeah, very nice, all custom made obviously for individual purposes. And the fact that they're using this expensive substrate tells me that they're probably using the same thing across all of their high frequency detectors too. So, you know, 28 gigahertz and 16 gigahertz versions of this. And I think maybe even a 40 gigahertz version of this probably use very similar structures. So let's put this now under a different microscope. And here we have the module under the microscope. And now we can see all the wonderful building blocks of these type of diode detectors. So right away on the right side, there we go. This is our RF input coming in. And once the RF input enters the system, it's going to have to hit these various diodes. Now the low sense diodes, the dual diodes, do not have an attenuator in front of them. So we can see two diodes right over here. There's one at the top and then one at the bottom. And you can see they're in reverse of each other. And that's to be expected. I'll put the, the, the schematic of this on here as well. And then we, once we pass these dual diodes, these two outputs go all the way out onto the left side and they make it out of here. So we have our low sense plus and low sense minus part of this power detector. Now the high sense is going to require five diodes. It's much more stacked. Bringing them into the squirrel region for higher output powers and the combined information is of course what you're looking for. And those are these five diodes. You can see they're larger and there's quite a few of them and the reverse one at the bottom as well. And that puts you into high sense plus and high sense minus over here. There is really not much there aside from this resistive divider which sits in front of the high sense diode and that then gives you the attenuation required so that you can have the appropriate balance between these two diodes. Yeah, very nice. So everything kind of makes sense here. We can also use some of the features of the microscope to bring in and out some of these features a little bit more. Let me get rid of all these markers. There we go. So we can focus at different planes here. So I'm focused on the metallization, but I can also go down and focus on the resistors there. You can see a little bit more. And I can use the diffraction microscopy to bring out some of these features a little bit more so you can hide, for example, some of the background. There you go. So you can see all the other resistive elements in the back are now quite nicely hidden. You can see some of the imperfections of the surface as well. And the Keysight logo or the Agent logo really shows up here. Very nice. We can also zoom in a little bit more if you want to. You see you get a closer look in some of these features as well. There we go. This is now 200. And we should be able to see, there we go, very nicely the different layers. You can remove the diffraction a little bit more so you can see the nice colors of these structures. Yeah, very nice. So we can examine this, of course, in, in more detail, but it's quite clear now how it works. We can walk through the input again. You see the diodes and then walking the other way. Very nice. Yeah, very beautiful. Yeah, there's not much places, I think, than on YouTube that you get to see the design from the top all the way to the bottom. So it's, again, thanks to the Patreon supporters. You guys really keep the channel going. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this quick teardown and overview of how these devices work. As always, thanks to my Patreon supporters. You make this all possible. And I'll see you in the comment section.